video is to accompany the making of Mary Anning, one of the women who made history dolls. And she has lots of different aspects to her. So I'm just going to start really by talking around the doll so you can get a good look at it. So um, one of the questions that I think we get a lot and we are going to be putting extra pictures in the PDF patterns for you is about the doll's hair. So the way that I've approached Mary Anning's hair is that you've actually colour changed in a scalp. So you will be moving between your oatmeal and your cocoa when you are crocheting that body and head so you have got a colour change scalp there and then to put her hair on top afterwards all that you're going to do is slip stitch in on the hairline so you're going to slip stitch in between the cocoa and the oatmeal and then do a chain and slip stitch back into the back of the head now that all I've then done is gone between the front and the back row, the front and the back row, the front and the back row, all the way around. And I've come down to create a line down the back of that hair. So that I'll just show you, I'll break it up to show you what I mean. So it's not that you're covering the whole of the head by any means. You're just going in and doing a chain from the front, then slip stitching in the back and going back. So I'll do one to show you what I mean. And actually, even though you'll obviously be doing the hair in cocoa, I'm going to do it in a lighter colour just so it's easier for you to see what I mean. So you go in and then you'll do your chain. And then just go back in to the back of the head like that. And then come back up to the front of the hairline. So it's not that you're working back down that chain on this design, you're just doing the chains on themselves and then you go back in and slip stitch into the hairline. So you go all the way around the head, um, going onto that back central line and that will put her hair in place. Worth saying, I would complete her spats first. So in terms of when you're using your cocoa yarn, all you're using the rest of that cocoa yarn for is to do the bottom of her spats like that. So make sure that you've done those first because that then means that you can use all of your remaining cocoa yarn to put her hair in place so just do those first then go back and work that hair on top of the hairline so that's her hair then the next thing um to really have a good look at is on her actual body here she's got this detail that runs again just edges off the shirt so all you're going to be doing there is adding that on between those color change lines again so between the bottom of the sleeves and the hands around the neck and then down the front of the shirt just to give that um slightly frilled pico effect on her shirt you have got colour changing in the body. So just to show you, when you have made the body um, here, you're going to be using cream at the bottom of the body and colour changing to the stone in the middle of the body um, like that. So her shirt's integrated. Then her skirt you make separately. So the camel skirt, um, you're going round and round and round and round and crocheting that separately. You are slip stitching the detail on the top and the bottom just so it feels a little bit more finished as the skirt. And then you're going to be making the apron, moving backwards and forwards in rows, same as the pocket. Now, the only thing to mention there is I have tacked the apron down just to stop it curling. So if you do find it curls a little bit when you've made it, just tack that in place on the front of the skirt so it won't move. Then the other um, elements of her. So that's really the whole doll done. Obviously, I've tied a knot then on the back of the apron. So it stays like that. So it gives it a nice feature. The way that these spats are made is um, they are effectively one piece, but you make them look like spats by doing um, that round of double crochets again between the colour line and then just put your three little cocoa buttons on like that. So the bonnet, the way that the bonnet's made um, is that you're starting from here. Um, you're doing your normal standard increase that you were familiar with. And then you actually move to working in rows on that front piece. So you're increasing in rows on that front piece. And then you rejoin to do the increases that give you the frill underneath. So I'll just give you a good look at that 3D bonnet as well. So you've got that. Nothing new um, really is a technique. It's just structurally a bit unusual in the fact that you change direction. Then her shawl, you're going to be doing trebles. And the way that her shawl, um, just to show you from the pictures, because sometimes it can be quite hard, the way that you then dress her in terms of putting her shawl on is you put her shawl over her shoulders as you would do normally with a shawl and bring that right round the front. And then I tucked it into her skirt line at the back. Um, like that so her, her shawl is right round her body crossing over at the front there you're going to be doing your trebles doing your increases on one side to, and then your decreases to create that lovely triangle shape and then you just do a row of the loop stitches to finish it off that will give you those tasseled edges 
So then the last two things to mention, really. Once you've made your shawl, you can use all of your remaining yarn to make your ammonites. So I actually am going to make the ammonite pattern start to finish for you so you can see that one. Um, this is what one looks like. It means that if you make your shawl first, you can use all of your remaining shale yarn to create these. They obviously perfectly fit in her pockets, but it also means you can fill her baskets up with them too. So to create the ammonite... And if you have got other grey yarn, um, you could obviously do an, a complete range of these once you've made and you've used up your shale yarn. So tie a slip knot and chain 16 stitches. And then treble back down that chain. So turn, come round and treble all the way back down that chain to your slip knot. And then what we're going to do is do front post, back post trebles. And this is what creates those ridges, um, obviously characteristic of the um, ammonite shell. So we're going to turn and do front post, back post. Um, so what you need to do to do that is turn back round on yourself like this. And this first one will be awkward, but then it'll get easier. Yarn round the hook like that and then come underneath around that post. So what you're doing is you're actually pulling that treble upwards and forwards like that and then work your treble. So that is a front post, then back round. And so a back post, what you need to do for a back post is you come in underneath, up this gap, push that one backwards, and then treble. So now we're back to a front post. So round your hook in the gap for the next post, underneath to pull that one forward. then a back post from underneath up to pull that backwards. So I'm just going to slow down and go really slowly again on these last ones. For anyone that's not done front post, back post before, but it's the way that you create a crochet rib effectively. So I'm going to go really slowly once more. So you go round your hook first, ready to do your treble. But rather than going into the top of the stitch, you're going to go in the gap and pull the treble beneath forwards like that. So you're going underneath it to pull it forwards. That's a front post. Then to do your back post, it's almost the opposite. So go round your hook in the same way, but then come up from the underneath. So you're going underneath over the top of it in order to push it backwards like that. There's your back post and then one final front post on that last one. And then all you're doing to curve it up into an ammonite, break your yarn and leaving a relatively long length, thread that up onto your sewing needle. And then all you need to do is fold it in half and do a running stitch between these two edges. So just fold it up like that and then just go through that side, back in through this side. And what you'll find is it will curve up on you as you go along anyway. There you go like that. So then just pull that nice and tight and that will curve right the way around like that. And then just fix that in place. So you can either sew it into the middle so it does have a full spiral curve like that. And sew in at the end on the other side. So then the last thing to show you is a basket and the basket theory um, of how you could go ahead to make lots more baskets should you wish. So she has a, um, she's often depicted 
obviously with a basket in order to carry the things off the beach that she had found on that Jurassic coast. And included in your kit, you're going to have 100 grams of oatmeal. And this is because I wanted to give you plenty of yarn to be able to make multiple baskets if you want to, with the idea that you could create a lovely scene of baskets with all your ammonites going inside. And so how these baskets are created is very similar to the way that an actual basket is created. So what you're going to do is crochet a base like this. Then you're going to crochet these stems that go all the way around. So they effectively form your warp. So these stakes are the structure that go around the edge of the basket. And then you crochet a rim like that. Then what you're going to do is actually uh, relax and really enjoy crocheting meters and meters and meters of chain. And that's because what you're then going to do is actually weave your basket using the chain. So this is the structure before you start to do that process, just so you can have a good look at it. So you've got a base, you've crocheted up your stakes and then slip stitch back down again to that base so that you've got those those. Um, prongs that go around the outside then you do your rim at the top and then you just chain this long length off the top of that rim then what you do is you actually weave your basket so what I would recommend is once you've done your really long chain wrap that chain into a little ball for yourself that will make life a little bit easier and then what you do is you go in and out actually weaving your basket. Now, what's really important when you're creating it is that you have an odd number of stakes. So you can create baskets of any size. Just make sure that you've got an odd number of stakes. If you wanted a more open basket rather than a closed one like this, all you would do is put more chains between the top of the stakes. So you could even, if you wanted it to be a big open wide basket, all you could do is do five or six stitches in uh, chain stitches in between the stakes and and then you'll just need a few more meters um, in order to do the weaving. So from this point, what you do is you go under this one like that and then over the next one. So over the top of the next one, then under this one. And then over the top of the next one. And all you do is you carry on going round and round, weaving your basket from the top down. Now, um, it is a little bit fiddly when you get used to it because you've got a big ball of chain, obviously, in your hand. Once that gets smaller, it does get a little bit easier. What you need to watch when you get back round is... What's important about having that odd thing is that you need to make sure that on this row above, so on this kind of rotation above, you see we've gone under this stake. You need to make sure that that one is going over that stake on the next time round. So then I was under last time, so I'm going over on this one. So you just carry on with that pattern of going under and over. So the thing about this is obviously it's not an exact mathematical calculation because it's all going to be dependent on how you are weaving it. So how neatly you're weaving that together, how densely you're putting those chains in. So if you get to the end of your basket like this and you discover that you haven't quite got enough of the um, weft effectively, you haven't quite got a long enough chain to finish the wraps, all you'd need to do is get your yarn and slip stitch into the end of the chain and then just add yourself a little bit more chain on. And all I will say is don't go mad. I wouldn't add necessarily um, meters and meters and meters more. Um, maybe add just a bit of a length, less than a meter um, so that you can finish it off. But if you're the other way around, so if you discover that you finished your basket and you're happy with it, but you've still got chain left over, then obviously all you can do is you can either sew that in and leave that on the inside if you want to, or you could snip that off um, or even pull it back a little bit and then just tie the end in. It obviously won't be exact because it will depend on how tautly you have pulled that um, those wraps as you've gone around. But that is the lovely effect that we are looking for, that you will look like you've got a genuine um, woven basket in order for Mary Anning to put her ammonites on the inside. All you then do once you finish your basket is add your handles on wherever you want them to be. Or as I said, you could even make larger open top baskets that sit on the floor that you could fill up with ammonites to go around her. 
So I hope you really enjoy um, this project. It's a very different technique. This obviously it's not fast, um, as I think you should. You could probably tell there. There's nothing fast about weaving baskets, um, but it is actually quite therapeutic. So I hope you really enjoy doing it. The one that I've just made here is all oatmeal, whereas um, in the pattern and the first one that I've made, I've got the um, struts coming down in the camel underneath. So it looks even more realistically like a basket. The choice is yours. Um, go ahead and have some fun with this one. Um, I can't wait to see your pictures when you finished her.